Back at it again with the Mobius Dickus, Chapter 70, The Sphinx. So in the intervening chapters, uh, since Chapter 60, I suppose I skipped over this for Chapter 66, um, we've had uh, Stub catch and kill a, a sperm whale, the first one that the Pequod, Pequod nabs. And there's some various descriptions of the uh, way that the whale is kept and it's basically tied to the side of the ship and kind of dragged along the ship which is how the sharks can eat it but this is a description of the anatomical process of cutting off the whale's head uh, which i assume is relevant because you need to get uh, the oil out of the sperm whale's reservoirs that are located in its head so uh, while this is a somewhat you know macabre description of the uh, whale being decapitated, it quickly becomes figurative once Ahab comes out of his cabin and starts to stare into the uh, the head of the whale. Now, of course, the title of the chapter is The Sphinx. What is the Sphinx in you know mythology? It is the uh, mythical being, which, if you answered its riddle correctly, would let you go. If not, give you reward. If you answered its riddle incorrectly, it would kill you. So what riddle is Ahab trying to discover in the head of the sperm whale. Well, it shouldn't be any surprise that it has to do with the question of knowledge and the questions that arise in chapter 36 and chapter 42. Okay, uh, questions of meaning, questions of motivation, of cause, effect, uh, chance, free will, fate. So, as we've discussed throughout many chapters, Ahab sees the image of the whale as an image of that animism that he believes in chapter 36 is part of life that there is a spiritual or a natural or a metaphysical something that makes your choices uh, matter and are motivated by something beyond your pure physicality so first what the passage does is it establishes uh, all the different types of knowledge that ahab projects onto the whale he says Thou speak, thou vast and venerable head, which thou ungarnished with a beard, yet here and there lookest hoary with mosses. Speak, mighty head, and tell us the secret thing that is in thee. Of all divers, thou hast dived the deepest. That head upon which the upper sun now gleams has moved amid this world's foundations. So we've gone from top to bottom, right? Where unrecorded names and navies rust, and untold hopes and anchors rot, where in her murderous hold this frigate earth is ballasted with bones of millions of the drowned. There, in that awful water land, there was thy most familiar home. Thou hast where bell or diver never went, hast slept by many a sailor's side, where sleepless mothers would give their lives to lay them down. So he's talking about all these different ways of discussing the fact that the whale has had access to the bottom of the ocean, which is not only itself a good image of the unknowable or the inhuman seeing as humans can't go there but obviously he's also talking about the dead bodies of people who fall to the bottom of the ocean having drowned or been killed at sea and of course death is another place which is unknowable for the human being so in that sense in those two senses the sperm whale well represents two different forms of privileged knowledge Thou sawest the locked lovers when leaping from their flaming ship heart to heart they sank beneath the exulting wave true to each other when heaven seemed false to them thou sawest the murdered mate when tossed by pirates from the midnight deck for hours he fell into the deeper midnight of the insatiate maw and his murderer still sailed on unharmed while swift lightning shivered the neighboring ship that would have borne a righteous husband to outstretched longing arms o head thou hast seen enough to split the planets and make an infidel of abraham okay so if we just stop there you know, the passage would just be another description of how whales are seemingly this symbol of, uh, of unknowability, of perhaps being able to strike through that mask and get access to those questions and that truth that Ahab wants to know about the world. Is there a God judging your actions? Is there a God changing the circumstances of your life to guide your actions towards others or punish you for bad actions? But of course, what does he say? that changes the meaning of the whole paragraph at the end here not one syllable is thine right the world no matter how much you interrogate it according to ahab and, and i think if anyone does a factual check on this it seems correct no matter how much you interrogate the world and try to strike through that pasteboard mask uh 
you can strike through the pasteboard mask. You can kill the metaphorical Moby Dick uh, because you think that it is an agent of God or the devil or nature or take your pick of animating metaphysical force. You can do that in terms of action, but in terms of just knowledge and truth, let's say you have a suspicion that a rock which fell off a cliff was motivated by and like crushed let's say it crushes a <laughs> who should i use here as a fun historical example let's say a rock falls off a cliff and it crushes hitler right uh you know maybe we read that or someone in the vein of chapter 36 reads that as an example of god animating the world in order to enact a metaphysical or divine justice okay well you can have that belief but let's say you take that rock and you lock yourself in a room and you say, okay, Mr. Rock, the first person who talks uh, is going to win. So just tell me, did you do it? Were you motivated by God? Of course, the rock's not going to say anything. Well, let's say you torture the rock. Let's say you like take a taser and you tase the rock. Is the rock going to start talking? No. Let's say you threaten to crush the rock's family. Rock's not going to talk, right? Because I'm not saying chapter 36 or chapter 42 is correct but it does seem that even if there is an animating force to the things that happen in life even if there is quote unquote a reason why things happen call it nature god whatever those reasons are not stated uh, i think one metaphor that another author uses is that god never signs his prescription orders uh even if the things that happen are influenced by something more than the physical that god never leaves a a signature not an explicit one so this is a moment of i think self-awareness from ahab that even if he thinks that the whale and moby dick represent or are motivated by the spirit of god or nature or whatever force you want to say controls human free will and choice and fate ultimately that force is silent in the world not a single syllable is thine hence why uh, at the bottom it says O nature and O soul of man how far beyond all utterance are your linked analogies not the smallest atom stirs or lives on matter but has its cunning duplicate in mind so according to ahab both mankind and the spirit of nature or god or whatever you want to call it they both are similar insofar as there's something behind what happens in matter so whatever happens or lives so that would be actions that would be on matter being like stuff not physical substance but as like an affair or situation nothing happens without having something behind it without having a cunning duplicate in mind of course what he says in this passage though is that even if god or nature does do things from behind the pasteboard mask of the physical that cunning dupli duplicate is never stated it's always silent so in that sense uh god is related in this analogy to i don't know you might be able to observe the actions of a human being you could say mr d ate 12 breakfast burritos in the cafeteria and then screamed the word pigeon like you could focus on my actions but i will never have to state my motivations you can guess you can say "Ooh, his actions were motivated by trying to make an absurdist joke his actions were motivated by sheer hedonism his actions were motivated by a chemical imbalance but i never have to speak a syllable to you about why i did it and according to ahab that's the connection between humans and the world is that they can both be silent for anything they do yet ahab still maintains his faith that there has to be something more beyond it he doesn't collapse because of that silence he doesn't collapse into the the emptiness of chapter 42 but it is a problem it is a problem that he if he is to confront moby dick that he can't like be about to kill moby dick and ask him so are you an agent of god or the devil or like are you just a fish right ahab has his position on whether moby dick is just a fish which is what chapter 42 would say he is but it's not going to be confirmed by moby dick 
at least not explicitly in terms of speech. Maybe you could read something symbolically as a confirmation, like if Moby Dick were to, like, I don't know, wink at Ahab and then, like, splash his tail in Morse code that spells out Ahab, maybe. But, of course, that would just be another form of speaking and, and would probably break this rule that not one syllable is thine. All right. Interesting discussion that talks about the kind of ambiguity between chapter 36 and 42, how they can interact and challenge and have tension between each other. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you in the next video.